Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to the Miami Center for Architecture and Design's uh, Town Hall on Housing and Mobility. And um, we will start a program in just a few moments. Please keep yourselves muted and your video off, which will help us with bandwidth and give us a better uh, presentation tonight. If you have any questions, you're welcome to put them into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you address them to everyone, we'll get to them at the end of the program tonight. My name is Colleen Stovall. I'm the Director of Programs and Events for the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. And I'd like to welcome you tonight to everyone who just joined us. Uh, please put your questions uh, for this evening for any of our panelists in the chat feature and address them to everyone and we'll get to them at the end of the program. And right now I'd like to introduce you to the Executive Vice President of the Miami Center for Architecture and Design, Cheryl Jacobs. Hey, uh, Colleen. Um, next up on the uh, program is actually Jason. So Jason, you're up. Hey guys. Yeah, gee, I thought maybe I got cut from the program. Wow. Welcome everybody. My name is Jason Hagopi and I'm currently the Miami Center for Architecture and Design President. Uh, for those of you, maybe this is one of your first, uh, one of our events you've been to, the Miami Center for Architecture and Design is the place for everyone interested in design and the built environment. We have community meeting space, educational programs to enhance public appreciation for architecture and design. We're also the home of the AIA Miami, as well as the Downtown Miami Welcome Center in partnership with the Miami Downtown Development Authority. The Welcome Center is everything Miami, cultural events, attractions, maps, history, and more. So MCAD has been busy, and I want to talk really quickly about one of our, our upcoming events called the Urban Warrior event, Urban Warriors Awards, May 20th. It's a hybrid event, virtual and in-person, although I believe the in-person tickets are all sold out. And even um, actually today, we have one of our finalists is one of our panelists for tonight's discussion at the chain. So, a super, super treat. This event is going to be amazing. We have incredible nominees, including the Honorable Daniela Levine Cava, the Mayor of Miami Dade County, amongst others. So, if you don't know anything about the MCAD Urban Warrior event, please go to our website, MiamiCAD.org, and see about sponsorship, tickets. It's going to be a fun night, and it's on May 20th. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all again to this incredible uh, forum tonight, Affordable Housing and Mobility. And I just want to give a brief introduction of the people, um, the two folks that helped make this happen. Um, they're the co-chairs of the, my, uh, the MCAD AIA Miami Urban Design Committee, Sandra Suarez and Mark Marine. Sandra is now on the MCAD board and she's a project manager at Perkins and Will. And Mark is the director of the FIU by design program in the College of Communications, Architecture and the Arts at FIU. So welcome everybody. 
And I'm going to hand it now, I believe, over to Cheryl Jacobs. And for those of you that may not know her, she's the Executive Vice President of the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. So Cheryl, it's all yours. So they keep wanting to give me the, um, the microphone, but uh, Sandra and Mark, why don't you come, come on? <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to tonight's event. Uh, Mark and I are going to give uh, everyone a brief um, summary of what's been going on. And so I'll share my screen now, but I just wanted to say welcome and thank you for being here. And so our town hall on housing mobility, uh, first is to just say thank you to the organizations have, that have supported this effort. Uh, Perkins and Will, FIU School of Architecture, Geo Urban Consulting, AIA MCAD, and AECOM. And then I wanna go ahead and introduce the individuals who are on the Urban Design Committee, which is myself with Perkins and Will, Mark Marine with FIU, Hernan Guerrero Applewhite with Geo Urban Consulting, Tim Blair, who is with AECOM, and Cheryl Jacobs with AIA MCAD. And what we've done, these are the recent events in Miami housing over the last uh, really almost three years now. And in December 2018, uh, there was a mandatory inclusionary zoning ordinance that was sponsored uh, by Vice Chairman Ken Russell. And that was approved by the Miami City Commission, the ordinance mandates the inclusion of affordable housing in certain projects in the Omni CRA district. This is a huge win for Miami as it was the first time um, that we've had a mandate on housing. Um, it has since been disapproved, but it still kind of stands as a big step forward for housing in the city. In March 2019, there was a debut of a new free online mapping tool that was developed by the University of Miami's Office of Civic and Community Engagement. It identified more than 500 million square feet of vacant, unused, and underutilized land across Miami-Dade County and its 34 municipalities. That's about the landmass of Manhattan. And one of our panelists today, George Damien de la Paz, was part of that effort. Uh, in April 2019, the City of Miami District 2 launched its six-month scooter pilot program that introduced micromobility to Miami. And it's been an on again, off again love affair, uh, but it has been part of our conversations um, for housing and mobility. And in November of 2019, there was a podcast launch of There Goes the Neighborhood on the stakes from WNYC Studios on the consequences of sea level rise on Miami's Little Haiti neighborhood. And those researching it, like Jesse Keenan from Harvard, as a case study for climate gentrification. Thank you, Sandy. In January 2020, after nearly five hours of deliberation and public testimony, the Miami Affordable Housing Master Plan took another small step closer to fruition Friday after City of Miami commissioners voted five to zero to accept the study's findings. In March 2020, uh, the AA MCAT created a Housing and Mobility Committee, and we held our first roundtable discussion. In December of 2020, we held our second roundtable discussion leading to today's event, and we are excited to host our first panel discussion regarding these pressing issues. If you could go forward. Great. So a little synopsis, uh, roundtable one, the conversation centered on considering how the cost of housing and transportation as a percentage of income affects affordability overall in a city with limited public mobility options. The Center for Neighborhood Technology places these two costs for Miami at 50% in some neighborhoods. And the combination of housing and transportation costs provides a more comprehensive view of affordability than housing alone. The question for the group discussion was, how might we integrate and implement disruptive transportation models into a housing program to create a sustainable cost of living for Miami's working class neighborhoods? And here is an image of our invited guests participating in a brainstorming uh, session using the IDEO process. Thanks, Sandy. And then uh, roundtable two for our housing mobility workshop evolved based on our discussions with our planning group. The focus for this workshop was to brainstorm on ideas for Miami's urban plan for housing. 
10,000 units for Miami-Dade County. We did the workshop in collaboration with our partners, bringing together the work of many in our community. The workshop used Zoom for the virtual meeting with three topics, three teams, and three breakout sessions. Each session had a topic with a question to jumpstart the conversation. We then used Moreau, an online visual collaboration platform for teamwork. The three topics included scattered sites, mobility-oriented design, and policy. And here's an image of the workshop overall and what it looked like at the end of the three uh, sessions. And then here's a uh, close up of uh, the mobility oriented design session and some of the ideas that came up uh, on that session. And some of the favorites were um, what would it take for you to stop seeing micro mobility as a novelty and instead see it as a viable transit option. Um, the other one was would love to have the discussion include electric car share programs of parking for residents and uh, slug lines uh, that we had a long discussion on slug lines meet at certain place next person comes in and sits one specific pickup one specific drop off free no communication allowed um, one example was DC and this was all kind of part of the housing uh, program and so where we're going uh, now is um, really to develop the housing, um, the urban plan for housing and uh, what it looks like and how we get there. And so I'm gonna hand off to Cheryl Jacobs and our distinguished okay. guest. Okay, now I'll take the mic. So, um, I just want to thank uh, you guys for the incredible work that you're doing. Um, we want to, one of the things that I think we do really well at uh, MCAT is uh, to be a convener. And there are so many organizations that are doing so much work around these issues that what I'm hoping is that we can um, be the one element that brings it all together. And, uh, you know, if, if we share what we're doing, I think that we'll have a better uh, chance of uh, being successful. So let me take uh, a minute now, I'm just going to do a quick intro um, of our panelists. And if you would turn your, your videos and mics on. Um, Avra Jane, who is the uh, co-founder of the Vagabond Group, uh, Commissioner Eileen Higgins, who uh, we all know and love, Commissioner from County Commissioner from District Five, uh, which is our district here downtown at at, uh, at MCAD, and uh, George Damien De La Paz. He's a senior strategist with the county's office of the mayor. And um, so welcome all of you to, uh, to our program. And I'm really excited to hear what, uh, what you got to say. Um, so let me, let me start with um, a big question. <laughs> uh, what, what do you see as the largest hurdle? Uh, and what's preventing us from reaching, you know, more capacity in affordable housing? And it's interesting because we have the private sector and the public sector. So I'm going to start with Commissioner Higgins. Okay, well, that's easy. It's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being interested in this topic, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think sometimes people think I'm the transportation commissioner because I talk about it a lot, but actually my number one priority uh, is affordable housing and it is what I have spent the most time uh, considering and activating since I was lucky enough to be elected to the commission in, in 2018. Uh, from, like if we separate the public and, and private sector from the public sector perspective, you know, I mean, if I, if you go, if you want to just like at make affordable housing simple, simple, right? It's uh, the cost of steel, the cost of concrete, the cost of labor, the cost of land, right? At a very basic level, and, and all of those have been very, very, very expensive here in Miami-Dade 
County. And then when you look at the jobs we have here, we are a service sector economy. We have a lot of tourism, we have a lot of restaurants, and those tend to be uh, low wage uh, jobs and low benefit jobs. And then you add on to the fact that a lot of our for-profit real estate market, particularly in terms of uh, condo market, a lot of those, like you look at the condo building and you think, oh, we're building housing. Why isn't the price of housing going down? Many of those units are not homes. They're bank accounts, right? And I'm, and I'm talking a lot, you know, this is sort of the, I have the pre-COVID data, but we are very similar to places like Seattle and Vancouver, where there are people who whose home countries are very volatile, particularly financially volatile, and they choose Miami real estate because it is safer than keeping their money, whether it's in Venezuela or Brazil or, or Colombia. And we have a huge number of our condo units that are not actually housing. No one lives in them and the owners have no intention of renting them. So we're one of the very few markets in the United States where the people who earn the wages do not drive the price of housing. And it complicates things in a way that perhaps maybe it doesn't happen in a Des Moines, Iowa. And we, so those are a lot of the things that we're facing. As a government official, I have control um, plus or minus my 12 colleagues. I'm, but in, fundamentally, in our districts, our colleagues trust us. I have control over county land in District 5, and I can ask the question, is this land being used properly? And how can we activate it for housing, or should it be activated for housing? Because that takes one of the cost factors out of the equation, right? Steel and concrete, labor, land. Well, if the land is the people's land, perhaps we can um, activate that land in a way that, that builds more affordable housing. And, and as a result, in District 5, which is very dense, you all know, like, I, I'm your commissioner, there's buildings all around. We, we are not like, this is, this is not South Dade or West, you know, the Western part of the county where there's land. We are jam packed in. But even in my district, I've identified over 50 acres of underutilized county land. And right now, um, primarily using state and federal money with public-private partnerships, I have plans that are you know, financed in the works to essentially either renovate dilapidated units and, re and replace them and also build nearly 4,000 units. So county land has to be part of the solution. And I would say at least in District 5, it, it had not been evaluated in an, as an intense a way as I thought it could or should have. And then we have all kinds of other things that we can talk about later as far as programming that helps incentivize the private sector. There are lots of private sector people. I know we always talk about, oh, developers, oh, like they're nasty. But Developers are supposed to make money. That's their, that's their gig, right? They're part of the private sector. This is the United States of America. Companies are supposed to be profitable. Uh, that's, their, that's what they're supposed to do. But so there are companies and big developers and small developers that want to build affordable housing. As a matter of fact, we have one of them with us tonight. But they can't do it and lose money. And that's where some of our programming needs to change and adapt so that we can at a minimum allow them to make enough money to manage the property if it's a rental property or make a small profit uh, and and right now that's not that's not always possible so i'm working particularly on a new item that'll be at committee we just passed on first reading to increase the maximum sales price for home ownership uh, in the county to make it possible for developers to actually build units for home ownership. We have not built any for home ownership virtually because we have repressed that price so much. So there's lots to talk about. Anyway, I've gone on and on. Let me turn it over to someone else. So um, the, do you want, Aubrey, do you want to uh, address this? Just the major you know, hurdles? 
<laughs> Commissioner Higgins, it was really, really refreshing to hear your, your comments because it is, you, you put it simply and it is that simple. It's really a math equation, right? What's the land? What's the cost to build? And that includes the labor. And we want everybody to have fair jobs. Um, and what people don't always understand, whether it's public or private, you know, there's, you have to meet a certain threshold to even get a bank loan. You know, everybody thinks, oh, the banks will just lend you money, but they won't. You know, they are still under FDIC regulations. So it's not like, you know, you know, it's not that easy. And sometimes I would say, you know, even if you gave, gave away the land, and I'm curious, even if the land is free, is it still feasible to truly build affordable housing? Right. Like, like what, and what's the definition of affordable? Like to me, anything, it has to be at least 80% AMI. Let's say it's a blend. And I believe in having, you know, um, mixed incomes in a project. Right. So, but the, the reality is, is the cost of construction is really expensive. Uh, um, and, and sometimes it's hard to meet those, those thresholds. There are other fixed costs that I think, that people should talk about more operationally, where there may be some opportunity. I know there's some legislation at the state level that will help. One of the things I always complain about is the other thing is an other fixed costs, right? Let's talk about the fixed costs is the real estate taxes and in insurance. You know, I have to get insurance. You know, if I have a bank loan, which I've done for affordable housing and, um, you know, BAC, one of my, you know, great banks that really wants to be part of that. You know, the reality is, is I still have to get wind and, and everything. Price of insurance went up 15% last year. Um, the real estate taxes in this city, they still charge me real estate taxes based on highest and best use. You know, when we've asked them to charge based on income, which is one of their parameters, but not their only parameter, it would be in violation for this at the state level. We've asked them to just charge us based on income and they can't. Now there's the state legislation, there's some um, policies where they're talking about giving, um, reduce, d discounting the assessments, you know, as much as 50% or um, based on affordability. Um, and hopefully that'll be at the right threshold. Workhouse, workhouse how, workforce housing, I don't, cons I don't consider $2,200 a month for a studio apartment, you know, affordable. Um, <laughs> So, but, but at 80% MI and below, you know, so hopefully that legislation on the real estate taxes comes in. But just one thing to just, just as an overall to say to everybody, you know, we're talking about bricks and mortar and equations and how do we do this? Affordable housing is, it's, it's not bricks and mortar. It's a social issue. And we, it's important for all of us to care a lot about this. This is about our social resiliency, you know, how we are as a community. And that, and this, this, so the, importance of this it you know goes beyond just you know this idea of you know building bricks and mortars obviously the easiest solution for affordable housing is as if everybody was making more money i mean people go oh miami's not affordable well it's, it yeah i mean you know fifteen hundred dollars for a studio apartment and it's thirty five hundred dollars in new york city so it's not about being affordable it's the problem is 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 the jobs and hopefully commissioner with some of the changes now and the businesses that are coming here, that'll help, you know, the affordability um, equation. That's interesting. Um, you know, thinking of it, that's like a holistic way to, to look at it. It's not just the cost to build something, but it's the cost to the people uh, to, to, uh, to rent or buy. Although I, I, I don't think that, you know, every, everybody doesn't have to buy. Um, you know, I think renting is, is something that people shouldn't look down on. I mean, you said something interesting. You said the cost of the people. So when we've done affordable housing, like think of a single mother and their child. If a, if a mother feels like they can't provide for their child or they're living in NOAA housing, natural occurring affordable housing, which I've walked, which are some of the stuff that I do, which is basically slums. You know, the plumbing under the building is not even connected. Um, you know, there's mold in the buildings, there's all these things. I mean, remember this, we're talking about people in their lives and what does it mean? How does it affect their stress level? Are they safe? The bars on the windows, are the doors wooden? You know, all these things. So, you know, we're talking about people's lives. We're talking about how they feel about themselves. We're talking about how children feel safe to go home. We're talking about, you know, this idea of feeling safe 
and um, in creating a healthy environment. They just emotionally, physically, you know, for self-esteem. I mean, that's really what, if, what we're talking about. We're talking about affordable housing. We're talking about people's lives, not just their buildings. Absolutely. Uh, we, we, George, do you want to add to this? I'm sure you do. <laughs> of course. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. I would like to quickly thank the organizers for putting this town hall together and the panelists and participants for their time. I'm going to step back a little bit and rewind to way before the pandemic. In October 2019, the county set an ambitious unit goal of having 10,000 affordable units either under construction or completed by the following year. And due to the leadership of the mayor, Commissioner Higgins, the Board of County Commissioners, and the Department of Public Housing, we have reached that goal despite the pandemic. There are already 14,000 new affordable or workforce units in the pipeline, which includes developments uh, renovated by Avra. And to give you a sense of scale, the entire city of Key West is 13,000 units. So to put that a little differently, the county will soon gain a small city's worth of new affordable and workforce housing. And many of these units are on or near an existing or future public transit corridor. Even with those historic gains in inventory, the demand for housing continues to outpace their supply. In order to meet this demand, the county must continue to produce more units even faster. Uh, the University of Florida and Miami Homes for All estimate that we will need to build or preserve 200,000 homes by 2030 to keep up with this demand. And getting to that goal is gonna require various strategies. Uh, including assisting renters and owners, leveraging underused land, preserving existing units, and increasing funding for development. Wow. Um, you know, when you put it that way, uh, it, it's just a drop in the bucket as, as much as it sounds. Um, and, you know, I never thought of it in terms of the size of Key West, but that really puts, uh, puts it in perspective, that's for sure. Um, so what, what, what do you think, um, now we have the public and the private sector, and um, I think sometimes there needs to be better communication or more connection between the public and the private sector, because when you go to Urban Land Institute meetings and talk to, Avra, you're, you're not the standard developer, you know? You're, you're special and, and you're a person that cares about, you know, what they're building and who they're building for. But what do you think is needed to ensure that developers and policymakers come to terms or communicate better to, to help move a lot of this forward? Or is that, do you think even that that's an issue? Um, Eileen, you want to start with that or? Uh, yes. I will. I, I remember when I first got on the commission, I began to realize that if I wanted to build, I'm making it up, a 30-story building of luxury units, and I wanted to build a 30-story building of affordable or workforce units, it would take the same amount of time to get my permits, right? And so I actually passed legislation, it took quite a while to make sure that any project that had affordability in it, that these projects moved to the front of the line in terms of permitting and worked pretty hard with RER. And in some of our departments, I think we've made great progress. We were able with the systems uh, to do this now. And by the way, every now and then a developer actually now forgets to check the box. This has a thing of affordability, but now you're able to check a box that says it's affordable and it's supposed to go to the front of the line in, in all of the departments. Uh, Derm, as we all know, is kind of like, I don't know, the anchor dragging all permitting <laughs> to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> Did I say that? I hope this isn't being no. yeah. <laughs> well. Uh... But anyway, um, Derm has some computer system issues that don't allow it yet very or very inexpensively nor quickly to be integrated with the other permitting. And we piloted a few new things about meetings and I actually have, um, I've been secret shopping the process. I have three rather, I, I don't wanna say large, but good size developments going through the process. 
And um, by the way, the departments know that I'm watching this and, and we're kind of keeping a dialogue of what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, because, and now water and sewer, I believe is doing a little bit better. So we're just starting to get the feedback on that, but it's absolutely ridiculous that if, you know, no offense to the Ritz-Carlton, but if you want to build Ritz-Carlton residences versus you want to solve our affordable housing crisis, that your permitting process is the same. This is a crisis. Things that are in crisis go to the front of the line. That's the deal. And, and so that is something that I'm very proud of, even though I realize we're still testing and learning um, learning on the system. And, and I know we still have more work to do in Durham, but I believe even on MOTs, they like if you go to D, the Department of Transportation Public Works, that could feel like a black hole. I see Ever yeah, nodding. Um, so <laughs> there's the idea that like just a maintenance of traffic for construction is what's slowing down the building of affordable housing. I mean, it's almost immoral to, to think that government processes are slowing down the building of affordable housing. So that is that is something uh, that we've done. And we have, just to test this, we're doing some, um, with our developers, we're bringing together a one-all meeting where everybody in the permitting is together. And hopefully we'll get better. And um, certainly in some cases, we've, it's been very, we've been very, we've been complimented and others, um, you know, we still have work to do, and I know that, and and I I think the I think the administration knows that too, and you know, I for those of us that are religious, I just continue to pray for Durham. That's and sometimes it's hard to trickle down from the top to you know to get to that person that's at the permit desk. Yeah, um, Avra, did you want to comment on that? Oh gosh, I, I, you must you must be building because you're hitting all the all the right things. You're right. By the way, public works like, and that's the problem. You know, when you go through this process, and you mentioned Durham, of course, everybody knows Durham. But it's like when you hit one roadblock, it's everybody else could have tried really hard, and I and everybody does have good intentions. I think Ace and the building department is doing well, and it, you know, obviously these new systems and and I and so I everybody wants to do better that's for sure um but if you have one portion of this not work well it doesn't work in it, whether it's derm which we all know and i think they're trying to bring a derm officer into the building department which they need to do and so that there's better communication but public works all of a sudden you know public works can hold you up for months so you, all these people could have done heroic efforts and then you've got one department that holds you up yeah. I mean, it's like, that's the reality. And it's, yeah. it's, and it's frustrating. I think, especially if you want to get the private side, I always, you know, you know, one of the things that I've always said in doing affordable housing, because I've worked with Mr. Liu and now I've worked with Omni CRA, is if, if you, the, the developers do want to do good stuff for the most part, and they certainly want to create goodwill. If they don't, they should want to. Um, you've, if, if you've got to make it easier, and certainly the permitting would be part of it, you know, I can tell you, you know, the administrative part of surtax or what, you know, it, it, it keeps a lot of the, I say, better developers. You know, one thing I would throw out there, Commissioner Higgins, is like, instead of, you know, developers were always asked, well, not me, because I do smaller projects, but in some cases, maybe, we're always asked to, to write checks for, for public works, right, for parks or do things like this. Instead of asking a developer to write a check for affordable housing or for parks or for this, Ask them to build, uh, uh, and maybe it's on one of your sites. Maybe, maybe the commission has a site. Who better to build than these larger developers that have a full platform, a full platform? And so for them, the cost of execution is much lower than a, a small start, a smaller developer. Or, you know, they don't have the buying power. So I think rather than the, develop, than the, than the commissions asking developers to write a check for public benefits, give them a piece of land and say, build us a building. Well, yeah, along those lines, um, what, do you, what do you all see as, in terms of policy, uh, that really needs to change? Um, because I know some of the things you spoke about, Eileen, um, but specifically, are there policies that, and I'm gonna throw this to George, 
Um, are there policies that the mayor's office is working on, probably with Commissioner Higgins' office, um, uh, you know, to change policy? And what are those kinds of policies that need to change? Sure. Uh, and before I do, I just want to point out again that Commissioner Higgins has been a consistent and fierce champion for fixing the regulatory barriers to building affordable housing in Miami-Dade County, from expedited permitting to modifying the infant housing program. She has a really long track record of bringing new housing solutions to County Hall. Um, so uh, and the communication is key uh, to, to integrate this with the previous question. Um, our housing department has organized several cross-sector community forums that include developers, community groups, and residents. From like 2018 to now, we've had an array of roundtables, practicums, and summits focused on this issue. And these sessions have led to you know, some incremental changes, right? From modifications to the, our housing RFPs to ambitious unit goals, like the closing in on um, 10,000 uh, housing summit. Uh, more recently, um, Mayor Levine Cava and the chair of the housing committee, uh, Commissioner Montesteen, have created a new round table series on housing solutions. And the first one was held last week. And it was focused on how partnerships with the faith-based community can drive affordable housing solutions. And, I think we really have to continue to convene and collaborate uh, with builders and the broader community to, to deal with this pressing issue. That's great. Well, uh, and um, so, I'd like what to ask about Georgia, policy? I'd like to ask Georgia a question. George, wait, wait, so, you know, I know we've sat on some of these committees together. What do you think about the ADUs, the auxiliary dwelling units, you know, and that this idea that, that we have and, and talk about infill, integrating people, because again, part of part of affordable housing is this sort of social solution, and then the mobility, right? If, if we can get people more on the infill lots and in these things, like auxiliary dwelling units, if, if people had zoning or, you know, had the space in the back where the county build a pad and plug in, you know, is there some sort of a prefab unit that would, that would meet the qualifications in the building department? I mean, we could do some things really quickly. How do you feel about ADUs and, and, and what number does that look like to you if, if there was policy around auxiliary dwelling units? Absolutely, it's a, a solution that we really have to consider. Uh, and the county has made some efforts to, uh, to do that. So in our previous surtax application, they set aside $2 million for innovative affordable housing developments, which is pretty experimental for um, one of our agencies. And the set aside was meant to spur local experimentation with new building materials, express accessory dwelling units, community land trusts, and other novel solutions. Uh, another change that the, the county has made um, that would increase density in, in a small way was modifying the infill housing program, which traditionally is focused on single family detached homes uh, to, to allow duplexes. And I think these are very preliminary steps, right? Like these are obviously not sufficient enough to like, to, to pursue um, this strategy fully. But I, I think what we have to start to do now is like, okay, how do we make some of these things more routine? How do we create the right amount of incentives to encourage more experimentation and innovation in the affordable housing space? Uh, Eileen, you wanna address that? Well, I mean, I think actually it's interesting. I hadn't really thought about the accessible dwelling units. This is why I participate in panels. Not that I know anything, but everybody else always does. So <laughs> I can think about it more fully and maybe propose legislation. Um, there's a couple of things that I've um, been trying sort of to bridge to what um, George was saying is we have kind of this, every now and then you get a big piece of land and you can do a big development, right? You can put a hundred units on there. But we have a lot of naturally occurring affordable housing as, and AVER works on that space. And hundreds of thousands of people live in those units. And right now, and I represent a lot of the city of Miami, in Miami 21, if it, depending on the developer who buys it, they toss those people out, they build, you know, four luxury things. So the zoning doesn't work for a lot of developers to be able to say, oh, I have like a nice little 100 year old or 90 year old building. And there's, you know, there's 12 units in here, there's eight units in here and they're, they're old, so they're not up to code. So I've done a couple of experimental um, things, both legislatively and that are in their first year of um, trial and error and learning. Uh, the first is I established, it's just got a million dollars, but if it starts to work out and did this through Data Heritage Trust, um, a revolving loan fund 
to preserve to historic buildings. And so we have the first building in that, in that process. Uh, and uh, so I have to kind of figure out, and I think it is actually successful, I won't, and we already have that building under construction um, or under renovation, better description. The other thing that I did in conjunction with Commissioner Moss, who used to chair our housing committee before, chair, for, before Jean Modestine did, he and I collaborated on a project that provided small business, small bridge loans, right? The big guys need whatever, $20 million. But if I buy a small fourplex or eightplex in Little Havana, all those units need to be renovated. And essentially the county can provide $15,000 in very low interest loans to help you renovate those units. So we set that program up and it's always good to have a guinea pig. So I have somebody guinea pigging uh, that, that process just to go through the application process. What is it like? How long does it take? What kind of documentation did you need? Did it go smoothly? Did it not go smoothly? And unfortunately, Director Lou, for those of you that have worked with him, know that he likes he likes these practice runs. He and he is very open to feedback, and it is too bureaucratic. Uh, so we'll have to make a, a little bureau, you know changes to the application process. But my goal is that when you have a good developer, like a meaning I well attention developer that really cares about our neighborhoods, cares about our historic housing and our older housing and, and naturally occurring affordable housing, that the county does provide that bridge money. And the other piece of the equation, which I am working on, is the state requires, George, you probably know this better, it's 35% of the money we get from the state has to be spent on home ownership we cannot get that money out the door. It is sitting in a bank account. And um, we and we do not have enough money for rental units. Like we can build rental units out the pop, 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 pop. And in a perfect world, I would transfer all that money there. Uh, but you know, the state of Florida, it's, it's a battleship. It takes, um, it's slow to turn and sometimes you have to battle with it. <laughs> but, um, the reality is that money is sitting there for home ownership, and we have for more than a decade capped home ownership prices artificially at $205,000. You can't even buy a studio condo for $205,000, which means it shuts everybody out. And we've done a great deal of analysis. Doesn't matter if you're building a single family home, you're building a, like a multiplex, like mid rise, you're building a high rise. If you're a developer, I'm gonna throw a number out there and I'll see if Avra nods or not. But essentially for a unit, you can't build it for less than 250,000, right? Maybe 240, maybe 280, depending. But it's impossible to build a unit for 205. So developers who wanna do the right thing, if they have the land, they're building for rent. They're not allowing home ownership. And I have an item that will be at our June committee, it just passed on first reading Tuesday, that will raise that rate to be indexed to um, some federal funds and will raise it to a minimum of 299,000, which, which developers can build and make a little bit of money. No one's gonna become rich doing it, but if you can build a unit for 250 and sell it for 299 and you're a well-intentioned developer, you can do it. And for me in my district, if the commission is kind enough to pass my legislation, which by the way, has a ton of resistance in the community, a ton of resistance, like I'm getting hate messages for doing this. Um, I know that I have, a, I have a developer that is ready, they have the rights to the land, that they will take a building they were going to build for rental and they will build 80 home ownership units. And what that means is a young physician's assistant, a nurse, a nurse, right? Uh, somebody working at the public defender's office, a teacher, a firefighter, people that have good jobs but aren't rich can get into their first home. And, and those are some of the policy changes, but I can tell you when, and Barbara Jordan, by the way, who's was like the queen of affordable housing. She was, oh, I see George knocking, like Barbara Jordan, like I just like follow in her shadow of greatness on affordable housing. And she and Commissioner Moss, they taught me everything I know. Uh, even she had a hard time getting, getting this passed because in the community, when I say 299,000 for home ownership, people say, well, that's still more than I can afford. But we have affordability issues at all income levels. 
very low income, medium income, right. and workforce. And this can help solve part of that because guess what? If I don't let those workforce people get into those units, they're competing for the lower priced ones with people that do have lower income. So I'm hoping I make that happen because I have a building ready to go. And, I, and if it doesn't happen, I'm gonna build a building that's just gonna be for rental. And then our working class families are not able to have the county activate their path to home ownership, which which would be a shame. Well, let let us know if we can ever help with advocacy, because you know we have a lot of members, and and we're always happy to do. I'll that. let you know when the committee comes up. <laughs> okay, um, it's, June, it's June something or the other. I can't remember. Okay, let let me know. Yeah. Uh, also, I just wanted to let everybody know uh, we do have a bunch of questions in the chat, and in a little bit we will be opening up, and I'll be reading uh, reading them to uh, to the panelists. Um, so, you know, the next the next thing in in terms of uh, policy um, is is funding policy, um, and uh, are there existing funding policies besides um you know just this this what you're just talking about in terms of the home ownership um are you have you seen things around the country that other communities are using uh that we could bring here uh, george sure and it combine uh the, the previous comments with the question um we're seeing a lot of interesting experimentation with our surtax program. So this is an affordable housing program that's overseen by the county and it generally is designed to provide gap funding for uh, affordable housing. But despite those limitations, uh, Director Liu and the Board of County Commissioners have found interesting and strategic ways to try to get a lot of yield out of the limitations of the program. So one of the things they did just in December was created a whole new RFP focus on owners of existing naturally occurring affordable housing. This is something we've never done before. Typically, we go to a developer and say, we can provide you got funding uh, to do a deal. And now we're saying, look, here's some resources to renovate a garden style apartment. Um, and that's exciting. But despite that, we are really hamstring, as, as Commissioner Higgins said, by the state of what we could do with surtax. The program was created in 1984. So think of how different the Miami market is now compared to then. It's just not and just it, the Miami market. Absolutely. It's everywhere. Yeah. Completely. But Miami in particular, you just think of how nuanced our various submarkets are. I mean, sure. we have rural markets, coastal areas, a dense downtown, a lot of suburban poverty, uh, fluctuations in, in speculation, higher construction costs. I, Miami is very particular, right? A really Byzantine governance structure. We have over 30 municipalities. Uh, we have to deal with all these small impediments in order to get uh, more yield. So when we think about best practices from across the country, I think we have to be really intentional about how we can modify them to fit the particular circumstances of Miami County. Well, that's true. I just feel like sometimes we're always reinventing the, uh, the wheel, you know, and, and we can learn from other communities. Although when you travel around, um, we're connected to uh, AIA chapters all over the country. They're all having this discussion. You know, it's not, uh, it's not, just us here in South Florida. It's, uh, I don't think anybody has that silver bullet answer for everything. Aubrey, I know you wanted to say something. Yeah, no, and I, I have to say, you know, I think Miami, and I think it's great people can hear Commissioner Higgins talk. You can see the effort that she's making. You know, George and I have sat on some committees for the last few years, and and um, Homes for All, and Annie Lord, all these people are really trying. I, I saw her nan earlier. So, Miami is trying, I think trying harder than people think. I mean, I think it's great, George, that you talked about how many units got done. I think yeah. um, Mr. Liu is, is making an effort. He understands there's some handicaps and he's trying to work through some of those issues. So I, I think that, you know, it would be good for the public to know that. And I can, I can say that with a lot of sincerity because I'm, I'm, I'm in it and I see it. And so I think sometimes, it would be good to, to talk about the positives a little bit, right? And uh, so I do think, you know, Miami has not stuck their head in the sand. I think it's good. I think 
I think that that's one of the things that people want to hear. Some of the companies that are coming here want to hear that, we're, that we are concerned about affordable housing and resiliency. I think that a lot of companies that, that do come here do have a little bit of a social agenda. So it's, again, I think it's in our best interest. Um, you know, I remind a lot of developers, listen, you're building retail on your ground floor. Well, the people that, the people that rent the retail or the restaurant and they open, you know, they're not going to be as successful. They're, they're going to have issues. They're going to, it's not going to be successful if there's not affordable housing nearby for the people that work there. And affordable housing also means back to mobility, you know, taking three buses to work, which is not an option, you know? Right. So I think that, you know, everybody understanding that this is in every, you know, this is part of the ecosystem, it's in everybody's best interest, not just because it's the right thing, just socially and economically, you know, is part of it. And I think it's good that we're talking about the positives. Miami's trying, I can tell you that I get calls from all over the country on the projects we're doing. We open sourced our project, um, guyvongroupconsulting.com, we, we put open source, we open source the entire project. So everybody could see how long it took, the issues that we had, you know, how much we spent, um, all those things. And, um, and I think having transparency, um, sharing best practices helps. Uh, but it, for, mo for most communities, it's the same thing. It's, we're back to the equation that, that Commissioner Higgins talked about. I mean, in the end, who's writing the check? And you know, having the free land helps. Um, you know, um, but you know, people go, oh, we'll give you more zoning, we'll up zone, we'll do this or do that. Well, if it's not affordable to build 100 units, it doesn't, it's certainly not going to be more affordable to build 200 units. Right. So, you know, you know, parking certainly helps back to mobility, you know, so anything we can do that changes that equation. And again, let's not overlook the operating costs, which is the fixed cost of real estate taxes. You know, um, the fixed cost of real estate taxes, that can sometimes be the difference between between a bank funding a project and not funding a project because because they're looking at NOI. So funding, so having the real estate taxes, the income based, or if the state legislation does pass, and hopefully this commission will get behind it. And then that maybe there's an I I'm throwing out an idea, Commissioner. What if all affordable housing projects that were put together, could we pool insurance? Could we pool insurance together so that again one of those fixed costs, which is typically a pass through to the residents, real estate taxes and insurance, is there a way to do something like that that could, um, again, help change the equation? That's an interesting um, question. And, um, you know, you, you kind of answered uh, one of my next questions. And it was, um, you know, what other items other than just subsidies uh, are needed? Uh, what are other and one of the things that impressed me uh, when we had a conversation recently when you were here at MCAD was how you managed to look at all the different areas for getting something funded. It's complicated and it, it's not just the typical go to the bank and, and get a loan, but you have to, there are so many different um, areas and um, I think that's really interesting if you could talk about that for a minute. Well, Commissioner, I don't know. I know you've, you've worked on, on getting um, funding, like, like the, you know, expediting the plans. I've tried really hard to say, why do you, like permit fees? Like if we're doing truly affordable housing, and they say to me, oh, Aubrey, if you were a non-for-profit or if you were an agency, we could forgive permit fees. I'm like, permit fees are it's a big number. I mean, those are the things that move the equation, you know, you know, maybe, you know, cause I, sometimes I see take the, 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 you know, policies take, take from one pocket to only want to give it back to the same pocket. I mean, you know, when we, you know, so, so maybe, um, maybe permit fees would be another thing to address. Like how could we, I know there's some considerations for impact fees, but you know, I've asked for permit fee reductions and nope. I've asked for permit fee reductions. I've asked for consideration on real estate taxes. I mean, and it's just like, you know, um, it's, it's, I'm having a hard time making the equation work. It's an interesting concept, Commissioner. No, I mean, I think we have to look at all kinds of, of issues. The real estate tax thing is a Tallahassee thing, which um, I actually, 
have been up twice talking to the governor's chief of staff about this, uh, which doesn't mean we have a bill going anywhere about how you could make real estate tax payments be flexible in the way, by the way, that they are for um, historically designated properties, right? I have the ability to, to reduce property taxes for historically designated properties, like when they're all official, official with all the constraints. Um, and that was done at the state level, but we don't have the ability um, to, at the commission level to, to make those changes that has to be worked uh, with the with the state legislators, but you know both permitting fees and impact fees are something that we could um, look at. You know, and and I actually remain convinced that on for profit projects, meaning like not affordable, like whether whoever's building them, people would pay more in permitting fees if permitting was faster, because time is money. Let's say I have a building and I have my construction drawings and it's an empty piece of land. And it takes me 18 months to get my permits. I'm paying real estate taxes on that empty piece of property for 18 months. So it's not free to have a piece of empty land. So for people that are building luxury or building office buildings or building this or that, or even it, it they might pay more for permitting if we could convince them we could get them permits in seven months, right? And, and that would allow us to be more flexible with pricing on permits for affordability. And, and I, I will tell you, we talk a lot about permits, but I do think in, in Lourdes Gomez, we have a person that is actively trying to innovate and making a difference there. I realize that for some of your building permits and other things around the county, you've got to go to a municipality, but I, Every time I meet with her, she's coming up with an innovation that makes it faster to, to turn this around. And I do feel as if we are in reasonably good hands with her, if she has the time and the people and the computer support, right, the IT support to, to enable, this, enable this to happen. Of course, all the other departments, trans, you know, public works, transportation, DERM, they don't all necessarily report into the same same system, but we have to make permitting cheaper, whether that is through time or whether it's through fees, because time can cost you as much as the fees. As the fee. Because yeah. you are still paying the real estate taxes. That's true. Uh, so I, I have a couple of more questions that I want to ask um, before we go to the uh, chat Q&A. Um, one of them is, uh, especially to Eileen and to George, how can we as citizens help you move your agenda? Eileen, you want to? Um, I mean, I guess for me, I try not to, I try not to call out the troops if I feel, even if, let's say an item is very exciting and I know it's going to pass, I really Sometimes it makes you feel good to have the community come to the commission meeting and say, I love this idea, I love this idea, but no offense, it, it takes time out of people's day to come. And I try never to ask people to come unless I truly need them. <laughs> like when I invite people to come, it's because I'm afraid. I maybe need one vote or I need a person to talk, you know, to talk, to make sure that this particular commissioner is connected to the idea and, and, and so if anyone is behind the scenes on these items willing to, you know, to help, we appreciate that. And, and you can always reach out to us. You know, the, the Tallahassee tax issue is, is very, very complicated because it's tied up um, with the fact of the matter is that for better or worse, whether we like it or not, the state of Florida is not run by, by Miami-Dade County. It's run by <laughs> other kinds of people and it's, <laughs> and it means we're not that well connected like I can yeah. talk to all of our day delegation about it and it, it doesn't mean that it gets through but it doesn't mean we can't start bringing these at least trying we have to raise awareness because it's like the old adage when you're selling right you got to ask for the order seven times you know the first no is just the first no you got to convince them and figure out why 
and and we have to go back we have to go up there stronger and, and i'll be the first to admit i have not gone up there with this as my number one priority so perhaps we should think as a as a group of people of, of finding a strategy and maybe a local advocate here um, and local advocates from maybe six or seven communities around the state of Florida through your other chapters, Cheryl, uh, where we're starting a, a statewide conversation rather than a, a Miami-Dade County Absolutely. conversation. Absolutely. Uh, George? Sure. So one of the first things the mayor had her staff do was listen to residents about the type of housing solutions they want to see. And Avra rightfully gets a lot of uh, focus for her exciting affordable housing developments, but she's also incubated several exciting community uh, development solutions in her capacity as a trustee on the Miami Foundation Board. And the Miami Foundation, along with uh, other community partners, has helped fund our Thrive Through a Five survey, which was completed by more than 26,000 residents across the county. That's 1% of the entire county population completing a survey. It is the largest and most extensive public issues oriented survey in local history. And the survey asked residents what type of services they want to see in Miami after the pandemic. So one in two respondents said that increased access to parks would be the most beneficial service to their long-term health post-pandemic. The survey also showed how COVID-19 has impacted Miami's various communities differently and identified several gaps in access to services, including the growing need for mental health services among younger residents and digital access issues among seniors and this is really helpful for we think through how to build affordable housing in the future to better meet the changing needs of residents by integrating affordable housing with access to parks and other public resources, we can create a more inclusive, vibrant and healthier Miami-Dade County. Thanks. Uh, so then the next thing, I'm gonna start uh, with Avra on this one. So what is the one takeaway that you'd like our group, our audience to, uh, to leave with uh, today. Turn my mic on. Well, just listen, I mean, this is a community problem. This is a community issue. I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have people like the commissioner and George and people that are really um, active in this space and sincere, you know, the amount of information that that, that George has been able to get together, data helps, right? Um, but in the end, we, you know, we can take all the surveys we want. We know we have an issue, right? And, and what was interesting about the 305 um, Thrive survey was, it was the parks thing too. So it's, it's not just about housing, it's about healthy housing. Sure. And, um, and, and, and that we should talk about healthy housing and, and, and what that means. And, and, um, and it's the quality of the space and it is the mobility and it's the amount, you know, it's the, it's light and air. And, and cause it's like just giving people a place to sleep is different than giving people a home. And uh, so I think let's just remember, this is about people's homes and it's about their lives and, um, and that we should all, we should all care. And if we're vested in this community, you know, as part of being community. That's great. Uh, George? So the one takeaway that I, I would want people to leave from this is a random fact from the Thrive 305 survey. It was that Hialeah, <laughs> the Redlands, and Miami Gardens support greening private homes. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. that's an and you can Elaine? check out- Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, you can also check out the results of the survey at thrive305.org. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, great, great. Um, Eileen? Just elect people who care about affordable housing. <laughs> I, so that I'm surrounded by more people. <laughs> people. I, I shouldn't have to fight to get my little items approved. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not running for re-election. You people are stuck with me for a while. So I, I don't say that self-servingly, but we have to put our vote where our values are, our money where our mouth is. If this is a community priority, right? I can afford my, I mean, I, well, you can pretty much see my whole house. I don't live in a palace, but I have a nice little condo in downtown. Right? So I can afford it, but many people cannot. And by not addressing this housing crisis with our low wage economy, we are 
pushing people further behind. We need to close the equity gap. And until we do that, we will not be a whole place. We will not be one of the most successful communities in the United States of America. We will always be battling intense poverty and inequality with this sort of like 5% of people flitting around. And I really believe if we can bridge that gap, this place is better for everybody, including the very wealthy, right? Because right. it's much more likely that they have, um, when people are secure in housing, guess what? They have time to become better educated. They have, they're spending less time in traffic. Their kids are going to school. Their kids are getting better homework education. So it really is, in my opinion, an economic priority. It's not just a housing priority. And so consider that. You know, we always have local elections, and I would love to tell you that the president makes all the difference in the world, but when it comes to housing, it's us. It's the little bitty people like us here in the county and in our municipalities that decide the zoning and decide if we can put incentives. And these things that George has proposed and Avra is talking about, they're not, they're impossible to pass in Tallahassee. That's where those people's values are but they're hard to pass even here. Even here. Yeah, you're right. And that, that was actually one of the questions that I didn't get to is, you know, if we don't fix it, what's, what's the community gonna look like? And that, it, it's really true. It's, it's something that, yep. Bad. Yep, it's true. So let me read a couple of these questions in the chat. Somebody um, was asking, oh, Angel, hi. Um, who or what law determines highest and best use? Like, how is that determined of property? Well, I can, I, I can answer, because uh, only because I've sat down with, by the way, the, the people in the real estate, uh, they're really supportive. Like, they want to find solutions. It, it, in this back to what Mr. Higgins said, it's a Tallahassee issue, and they're under very strict regulations. So, um, they, we've, they've taken meetings and we've looked at this. Highest and best really is, is what the market decides. So they're looking at comparables. They're looking at comps. So like what Commissioner Higgins was referring to, well, if it's worth more money to knock a building down and build a, a, a high rise, because that's that, because the lot next door is trading at that valuation, they're going to they're gonna value it the same. So highest and best use is what are your development rights? And it's the comp. What, what did the property next door trade for? And lots of times they're trading for the future, for a future value, not for what it is right now, which would have been a natural occurring affordable housing. Um, I tell you, we did a really successful project with the CRA in, in um, Omni CRA because they, 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 subsidizes that, they subsidize that difference. So you know, when we talk about that equation, one of two things either have to happen, either you voucher up the tenant so they can afford to pay more rent, which brings in a whole nother administrative layer and everything, or you just buy down the cost. You buy down the cost and the CRA bought down the cost. So in the case of the Omni CRA project, people were paying $750 for a three bedroom apartment. And you know they asked if I would do this project. First I said, no. And I said, well, what would it take for you to do the project? Because I had had already had <laughs> quite an experience. I said, well, you have to, you know, if we want to do a truly affordable housing, buy, buy the renovation, buy down the renovation. So the person paying $750 can stay in their three bedroom apartment. I mean, that's the purpose. That's the goal. And so we're back to who's writing the check or how do you adjust that equation? Unfortunately, that is not highest and best use. Highest and best use is what does the market bear? And the market in Miami is always trading forward and the forward value is more than what the affordable housing justifies. Justifies, that's true. So one of the things that, um, another question that's here that we didn't really um, uh, define is what is, how do we define uh, affordability in terms of our community? Wh whoever, uh, George, you wanna answer that one? Sure. So HUD expects that a household should spend over 30% of their income on housing costs. And that is a standard threshold. And then a lot of these affordable housing programs are structured around particular target populations and income groups. So it becomes really Byzantine when you start looking at 
the, the slew of different federal, state, and local programs, and what population they'll serve, and how to coordinate all those programs together. Uh, the University of Miami's Office of Civic and Community Engagement has created a really nice primer on funding programs, on the landscape of affordability, including a, um, a glossary of basic terms that I'll put in the chat now. Oh, that's great. That's great. And um, I have one question here, and I think, I think I'm going to uh, have the answer to this one, but I'm going to see what you say is, have there ever been discussions about integrating the permitting authorities um, so that we don't have 34 different, um, you know, communities uh, permitting things? That's a great question. I'm going to dig through Herald Archives and Commission Meeting Agendas <laughs> to find it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't see that ever, ever happening. It'd be fascinating uh, if it was proposed, and I would love to find out. Yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll have to, we'll have to research that. Um, so how specifically, um, just reading from the chat again, is uh, the city of Miami and Dade County incentivizing smaller developers uh, or land owners um, to to build these uh, to build projects um, like the amount of area zoned in Miami 21 for legal rental accessory units T3L is tiny. Most T3 areas are single structure only. Uh, and there's an entire stock of efficiency units missing from the central core. So, um, yeah, I mean that's one of, that's one of the things I brought up earlier. I think those those ADU units could be a, a solution. Um, and what could you do programmatically for that? And and could could we come up with a prefab program that would allow something to be done really quickly? You know, where we could. And, we're, and, and think about the integration, right? If you could get these efficiency units, it, it, you know, integrated into these infill lots and these scattered sites, you know, from a social standpoint, I think is also really important. I think the, I think the ADU um, solution is something that should be explored more. And, and, and the T3, the example that the question, the person posed a question is a great, is a great question. That, that, is, that is the question, that is the question. We have to continue to use that, uh, Sandra and Mark, you know, add that. I think that's something that we had discussed some, but we need to um, continue that, uh, that discussion. And, and also, um, you know, the issue of uh, zoning uh, and allowing uh, tiny homes, um, you know, uh, allowing more uh, on property. You're, you're smiling, George. I live in a tiny home. I live in a wood frame cottage that was built in 1925, which is why my natural light affects my, my background very quickly. Uh, but yes, I, I, a strong proponent for smaller, smaller dwelling. We have to look at land use uh, issues for that. Um, so what about industrialized construction in Miami? Um, and attack the 40% waste. I'm not sure what, oh, and the AEC, that's in the construction industry. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure there's a, a, something that uh, Hector placed, it's called Cornet e-submission system. I don't know what that is. So I don't know if that, it, you're smiling, George. Is that something you're familiar with? Or you're just a happy guy? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Hector. Um, so another, there's already an expedited permit process that high dollar value projects from developers and high end single family mm -hmm. homes utilize exactly the markets least beneficial to developing affordable rental and ownership stock, um, not far out west. Is that true? Do you, um, uh, uh, does anybody I know? I haven't seen it in the city, but I've heard what the commissioner talked about earlier. There is talk about doing this where you walk in, you have all the trades, all the, all the reviewers in one room, and you're looking at a set of plans all together very quickly. And um, commissioner, I think that's a fabulous idea. I think um, developers will pay a lot of money for that service. 
And that money could go to things like affordable housing. And I think the, the premium that people would pay for that would, would really surprise people. I think Commissioner Higgins has a pretty good idea, but I don't think everybody else does. People would pay a lot of money for that. And I think that money could be well utilized. So I haven't heard about that expedited. What you can do is you can hire what they call, um, you can hire a threshold, you can have owners, um, you can uh, threshold a engineers. Expediter. Yeah, well, they're not permit expediters. You can hire a firm that does. I tell you, I've tried to do it. Um, it works on big projects. You have threshold engineers on the projects and stuff. In my opinion, it doesn't save that much time. Um, I just assume deal with the city um, and have the inspectors come. That's my experience. I own super big projects. They have it. But it's, it's um, I like the commissioner's idea better. I think where the time, there's an inspection process. That I think the inspection process he's talking about is more on site. Like when you go through the process of building and inspections, um, you know, it does help with permitting, but more on site inspections. What the commissioner talked about was in pre-development. And that's where you, you could save a lot of time in pre-development. That would be huge. Yeah, 100%. And to make things worse, a lot of our existing affordable housing programs already require and have technically expedited permitting. It's just not happening in reality. That's some of the things that the commissioner has been working to fix. Yeah, that's we've, we've used an expedited process for, for some of our projects, and I'm not sure if it saves that much time, to be uh -uh. honest. I mean, it doesn't, you know. I tried it, didn't, I was, I mean, I had to, I wanted to try it, right? Now I think yeah. like, you know, when you start building bigger buildings, you have such, you know, you can have threshold engineer, that's something different. But I think with the commissioner's um, I, program that she talked about, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm speaking even for the city of Miami everywhere. I think every municipality, that would be a, a huge, that would be huge. And people will pay for it. They'll pay a lot for it. Yeah. So, um, is there, uh, we're, we're really over time, but the discussion has been really interesting, so I didn't want to stop it. I'm usually the um, whip cracker, but I love hearing this, uh, this discussion. And I, I want to um, make sure, um, wait, I'm reading another question that just came in. Uh, it's a, um, how about areas away from the city that are more affordable than those within the city? Um, if Metro Rail goes down to Florida City, um, that would have been one way to allow people to live in a more affordable location. Um, is that something that the commissioner, is that something you think would get uh, back on the uh, agenda or is in the long range plans? Well, I mean, the South Bay Corridor is extremely complicated and, and controversial because, of course, we were all, including me, lied to about the half penny, right? Started right. out as a penny, then that did, the voters didn't vote for a penny, and then they pitched as a half penny, except 20% of that half penny went to the cities, do whatever they wanted with, and then part of that half penny went for a free metro mover, and then part of the half penny went to making sure veterans wrote for free and that senior citizens wrote for free. So we have like part of a 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 half penny to help fund trains. Trains cost about $100 million a mile. Um, we are competing across the entire country for those. And it's not unique to the Trump administration. It was also the Obama administration, basically for what we call new starts programs, which are the big new commuter rail streets. The federal government tends to have $2.8 billion a year available, which means in the entire United States, you can build 28 miles of rail. And our South Bay quarter is quite long. Mm -hmm. And so when you're competing for those 28 miles, you have to really have some density. It's very hard. And our, our South Dade corridor, as you know, remains very low in density. And the ridership numbers, we would have gotten a low or a medium low rating out of the Federal Transit Administration. And when you submit for a rail project, um, you submit your data and you get what's called a rating. And you get a low, medium, low, medium, medium, high, or high. On a rail project, it takes between five and eight years to get your rating um, on average in the country. 
And we believed that this project would receive a low or medium low rating if we went with rail. And we would not yet have finished the environmental studies to even be in the process to get our rating. So somewhere between five and eight years from now, we would get a rating that says you're low or medium low. If you get low or medium low, you don't get funding. So we took an interim step, which is bus rapid transit. Um, um, I've, man I've lived um, in many places in Latin America, especially uh, in Mexico, I've ridden world-class bus rapid transit. Fundamentally, it's an above ground subway and it's a fantastic system. We knew that if we submitted that project, it's about a $300 million project, we would get a high rating and we would get our funding within the year, which is essentially uh, what happened. We submitted our studies in August. I flew up to Washington in February to met with the, meet with the FDA administrator. By February 15th, we had a high rating. By June, we had the money. <laughs> so, so, we, so we're building this bus rapid transit system as an interim. But if you live in Homestead or you live in Florida City, you are happier with this system because you will arrive at the South Dade station in less time than if it were a train because you can go nonstop. We're able to do multiple routes, which versus a train has to stop at every, every, every stop. And this will be operational basically two and a half years from now. And it, so we will have a mass transit system that will take a half an hour off the commute of people in South Dade operating in less than two years. We would not, if we had applied for rail, even have our rating yet. We wouldn't even be in line to ask for funding. So I know people are disappointed by this um, because they were promised rail, which again, wasn't the realistic. I am thrilled that we're going to have this bus rapid transit system operating in the next two and a half years. And then as our density and our ridership builds, we're designing these stations in a really cool manner um, so that they're easily adaptable uh, to rail. And we, we can do that. But quite frankly, if you get back to the affordability issue, <clears throat> affordable housing does exist in Homestead, naturally occurring and new, right? And it does exist in Florida. Florida City, this bus rapid transit system will save those people half an hour each way. So it's a fantastic transit solution for that part of the county that will be built and operational while we're alive versus in the queue to be denied. Right. And so I felt mm -hmm. as if I had to push forward this because I wanted transit to work. I did not want to keep promising the residents of this county something that we could, that was just fake. Like I could have voted for rail. It was fake. Like I know how to fund federal transportation projects. I know how to do it. And voting for rail is just the continuing the false promises of the half penny, like, like, we have to build what moves people. By the way, I have an, we have another awesome project also that's gonna make, you know, we have, we have much of our affordable housing out to the West. And I have two other bus rapid transit, one which we'll be submitting this August, which will move from the far, the Tamiami park and ride all the way into FIU. And it, again, it's gonna save people 30 minutes a day. I believe that I will have the funding for that project next June. And so sometimes you're making, you know, the, the promises of whoever was in charge, I don't really even remember who, um, on the half penny, I have to make decisions based on getting people moving and based on what I know can make it through the federal process versus just telling the residents, oh, sure, I can build you a train. I, I, I could tell you that, but I would be not very truthful to you in doing so. We, we are those, that South Dade project right now with the density down in that quarter is not competitive nationally. And I'd rather have a world-class bus rapid transit. You're gonna like it. I rode it all over Mexico City when I lived there for many years. It was a fantastic system. So um, as a matter of fact, I liked it better than the train. So, uh, you know what? I, I think a lot of people don't know that. Right. Uh, not, not that you like the, bus better than the train but <laughs> no, <laughs> don't know about the uh the you know the issue of of um of how the funding happened so yeah. um so i want to um thank you 
all three of you for your time. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion and um, you know, we're, we're kind of speaking to the choir, preaching to the choir, but uh, we have to keep the discussion going and keep everyone's feet to the fire and keep pushing forward. And, and I, I hope that our organization can help do that. And I wanted to just take a minute if uh, Sandra or Mark, if you had um, some closing thoughts about where the committee is going or um, anything that you want to say to, uh, to our listeners. Well, I first obviously just say thank you so much for a robust conversation. Um, it's interesting just to hear kind of how all the different pieces come together and you know that all you know the three of you have a relationship and that you're kind of always working on these issues and I think it would be interesting to see how we kind of fold this into um, into kind of one one big plan or one big idea to pull every all the ideas together in a sense you know not really sure how we would do that but um, it is it's very exciting to know that you're all kind of working on it and and it's kind of part of what you do every day and thank you I really appreciate it yeah I'm gonna I'm going to jump in there. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, and Sandra used the word robust. I'm going to I'm going to use the term candid. So I thank you all for your very candid conversation, because I think we all needed to hear it and we all understand and see on a day to day basis the problems at hand. And uh, it is the goal of this committee to keep pushing forward however we can to kind of move that needle. So we will circle back and, and come up with a game plan on how to kind of create some type of model that deals with policy, ADUs, and all of the other elements that were discussed today. And once we have that, we'll send out some findings, but, but thank you all and thank you for everyone who's here and everyone who gave up time out of their very busy day um, for being here as well. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Take Hi. care. Thanks, Great everyone. to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank guys. you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.